Sarah gasped. Did I make a noise in my sleep? No, Sarah. Sarah looked at Eleanor, who was standing so close to her bed that she was touching it. Then what are you doing standing over my bed? Didn't you know Sarah? Eleanor said, reaching out to brush back Sarah's hair. I do this every night. I watch over you. I keep you safe. Maybe it was because of the dream, but for some reason Sarah didn't feel like letting Eleanor touch her. Safe from what? Sarah asked. Safe from danger. Any danger. I want to protect you, Sarah. Uh, okay, thanks, I guess. She appreciated Eleanor's concern, appreciated everything Eleanor had done for her, but still, it was creepy for someone to watch you when you didn't know you were being watched, even if they were doing so with the best of intentions. I can stand by the door if it makes you more comfortable, Sarah, Eleanor said. Yeah, that'd be great. Sarah was pretty sure she couldn't fall back asleep with Eleanor standing right over her like that. Eleanor strolled over to the door and stood guard there. Good night, Sarah. Sleep well. Good night, Eleanor. Sarah didn't sleep well. She didn't know what, but something was wrong. In the cafeteria, Sarah stood in line with the other beautifuls as they waited to empty their trays. Lydia had texted the night before saying they'd all be wearing skinny jeans today, so Sarah was wearing hers too. She'd brought the jeans and a few tops and a couple of pairs of cute shoes when her mum had taken her shopping the other week. They'd also brought a few bras that they that did her new figure justice. Can you believe what she's wearing? She dresses like a preschooler, Lydia said. Like a preschooler from the poor family, Tabitha added. With horror, Sarah realised the girl they were criticising was Abby, who was emptying her tray ahead of them. True, Abby was wearing pink overalls, so the preschooler comment wasn't too far off the mark, but it seemed mean to reduce somebody's whole value as a person to the clothes she wore. That's Abby, Sarah heard, uh, heard herself saying. She's really nice. She's been my friend since kindergarten. She almost found herself saying best friend, but she'd stopped herself in time. Yeah, Lydia said laughing, but you've bought new clothes since kindergarten and she hasn't. The beautifuls all laughed too. Sarah tried for a smile, but she couldn't quite manage it. When it was Sarah's turn to dump her tray, she stepped on something slippery near the trash can. Her new shoes were cute, but they didn't have much traction. The fool felt it like it took forever, but she was sure it was only a matter of seconds. Then she was flat on her back, right in front of the whole school. Sarah, that was hilarious, Lydia said. What a klutz! She was doubled over, laughing. All the beautifuls were laughing along with her, saying, Did you see her go down? And she hit the floor like a ton of bricks. And how embarrassing. Um, in Sarah's dazed state, she couldn't really tell which girl was saying what. Their voices sounded distant and distorted, almost as if Sarah was trying to hear them underwater. Sarah tried to pull herself up, but something strange was happening to her body. She heard weird clashing and clanging sounds and couldn't figure out where they were coming from. It didn't make any sense, but they felt like they were coming from inside of her. She was shaking and jerking, and she couldn't make her body move the way it usually did. Her body was no longer under her control. She was scared. Had she hurt herself badly? Should somebody call her mom? Call an ambulance? And why were her new friends not helping her? They were still laughing, still joking about how stupid she looked and how funny it was. Then the beautiful's laughter was replaced by screams. As if from a great distance, Sarah heard Lydia saying, What's happening to her? I don't understand. I don't know, one of the other girls said. Somebody needs to do something. And why were her new friends not helping her? They were still laughing, still joking about how stupid she looked and how funny it was. Then the beautiful's laughter was replaced by screams. As if from a great distance, Sarah heard Lydia saying, What's happening to her? I don't understand. I don't know, one of the other girls said. Somebody do needs to do something. Wait, have I already read this part? I've already read this part, <laughs> for God's sake. I don't know how I, I'm sorry, I didn't realize. Uh, I don't know, one of the other girls said. Somebody needs to do something. Get a teacher, quick, one, another one said. A terrible thought occurred to Sarah. She put her hand out to her throat. Um. The necklace Eleanor gave her, the necklace that was never ever to be taken off, was gone. She must have knocked it off during the fall. 
She turned her head and saw it on the floor just a little more than an arm's length away. She had to get it back. A hand reached down to help her. Sarah looked up to see that the hand belonged to Abby. She took it and allowed herself to be pulled up into an awkward standing position. When Sarah looked down at her body, she was the reason. Uh, she saw the reason for the girl's screams. Her body was changing. From the waist down, she was no longer a flesh and blood girl, but a jumbled... Hello? A jumble... Ah! A jumbled collection of gears and bicycle spokes and hubcaps, rusted metal odds and ends, cast off, useless parts that belonged in a wrecking yard. She locked eyes with Abby and saw her friend's horror at what she was, at what she had become. I... I I've gotta go, Sarah said. Her voice sounded different, metallic and harsh. Abby held out the necklace. You dropped this, she said. Tears sparkled in her eyes. Thank you, Abby. You're a good friend, Sarah said. She didn't say anything to the beautifuls who had all backed away from her and were whispering among themselves. Sarah grabbed the pendant and ran as fast as her new shambling makeshift metal legs could carry her out of the cafeteria and out of the school. Home. She had to get home. Eleanor would know what to do, would, would know how to help her. Sarah was still changing, her torso was hardening, and when she ran she made squeaking noises like a door with hinges that needed oiling. She tried to fasten the necklace around her neck again, but her fingers had grown too stiff to manage the clasp. As she hurried down the sidewalk with a clattering, shambling gait, people stopped to stare at her. Drivers slowed down their cars to gawk. People didn't look sympathetic, or even just confused. They looked scared. He was a monster, like something that had been created by a mad scientist in a lab. It was only a matter of time until villagers started chasing her with pitchforks and torches. I'm sorry, I'm I'm thinking about <laughs> Minecraft villagers. <laughs> Just villagers coming down, oh, chasing them with pitchforks. That's great. Um, she felt like crying, but apparently the kind of thing she was becoming was incapable of producing tears. Maybe tears would just make her rust even worse. Her joints were getting stiffer and stiffer, and it was growing harder and harder to run. But she had to get home. Eleanor was the only one who could help her. Finally, after what seemed like hours, she reached her house. Somehow she managed to work the key in the door. She clinked and clanked through the living room and down the hall, calling, Eleanor! Eleanor! Her voice was a terrible, metallic scraping. Eleanor was not in her usual corner of Sarah's room. Sarah searched the closet, looked under the bed, opened the chest at the foot of the bed. No Eleanor. Sarah clomped through the house, searching her mum's room, the bathroom, the kitchen, all the time calling Eleanor's name with her new horrible voice. The garage was the only place she hadn't looked. She used the kitchen entrance, but doorknobs were getting difficult to manage. Finally, after a few desperate minutes of fiddling, she was in the darkened garage. Eleanor, she called again. Her jaw was stiff and it was getting harder and harder to form words. Eleanor's name came out as Eleanor. Maybe the robot girl was hiding from her on purpose. Maybe it was some kind of joke or game. She looked at the ceiling high storage cabinet against the back wall of the garage. It seemed like a good hiding place. With some difficulty, she grabbed the handle of the cabinet door and pulled. It was an avalanche. Clear plastic bags holding different objects with different weights and sizes toppled out of the cabinet and fell to the floor with a dull, sickening thud. Sarah looked at the floor. At first... Her brain couldn't even process what she saw. One bag contained a human leg, another a human arm. They were not the body parts of an adult, and they didn't appear to be the result of an accident. Blood pooled in the bottoms of the bags, but the limbs had been severed neatly, as if in a surgical amputation. Another bag stuffed with, a bloody, with bloody snake-like entrails, and what appeared to be a liver slid from the cabinet shelf and landed on the floor with a wet splat. Why were there body parts in her garage? Sarah didn't fully understand until she saw the small bag that held the familiar looking potato shaped nose. She screamed, but the sound that came out of her was like the squealing of a car's brakes. Behind her came a metallic, tinkling laugh. Sarah's lower body was almost immobile, but she dragged herself around to face Eleanor. I made your wish come true, Sarah the pretty robot said with another metallic giggle. And in return, 
Sarah noticed something she'd never seen on Eleanor before, a heart-shaped button just below Eleanor's throat that was a double of Sarah's heart-shaped pendant. Eleanor laughed again, then pushed the heart-shaped button. She jerked and shook, but she also visibly softened, her silver finish turning the pinkish shade of Caucasian skin. In a matter of moments, she was a dead ringer for Sarah, the old Sarah, the real Sarah. The Sarah who, looking back on it, hadn't been so bad looking after all. The Sarah who had spent way, way too much time worrying about her appearance. Abby had been right. She had been right about a, about a lot of things. Eleanor pulled on an old pair of Sarah's jeans, one of her sweaters and her tennis shoes. Well, you certainly made my wishes come true, Eleanor said, smiling with Sarah's old smile. She pushed the button that opened the garage door, sunlight flooded the room, and Eleanor Sarah gave a little wave, then skipped out into the sunshine and down the sidewalk. Sarah's ears filled with a deafening clinking and clanking. She couldn't control her movements. Different rusted metal parts disconnected from her and fell clattering to the floor. She was falling apart, collapsing into an ugly trash heap. A hideous, useless collection of garbage to be thrown away and forgotten. In an old mirror propped up against the garage in the garage wall. Oh my god, are you kidding me? Am I, am I not allowed to finish? I think, it, I think it's because it ends on a single page and I've got it in like a two page mode. Are you serious? I wanna, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna see the page. Page 78. There we go. She saw herself. She was no longer a pretty girl or a girl at all. She didn't resemble a human of any kind. She was nothing but a rusty, dirty pile of junk. She felt sad. Then she felt scared, and then she felt nothing at all. I love this story. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know what else to say apart from that. This story is so good. Um, I think, I think it did take a while to set it up, and obviously, like the killer moment is right there, where where she turns to scraps and 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 she realizes she was beautiful, the uh, the entire time at the beginning. Uh, and she didn't need anything else because, um, well, you know, it's it's the classic thing of um, be careful what you wish for, you know. You might wish to be more beautiful, but that's not necessarily going to be a good thing um, because you are beautiful as you are. Uh, <laughs> that's the moral of the story. Um, I really like this. I really like this. Uh, it sets up a lot uh, and it... As like the second story in the Fazbear Frights, I know a lot of you aren't, but those of you who are reading like the Fazbear Frights for the first time, and this is the second story you've heard, this like this is a really good setup for what to expect later on in the series, because this is incredible. This is one of the best stories I think in the series. Uh, there's a lot of improvements I know I would make, but like th this story, just the the concept of it is fantastic. Um, so I hope that you enjoyed these audiobooks. I am very sorry that it took like five months to get this one done. <laughs> um, but um, we, we did it eventually. And next time we are going to be doing Count the Ways. Uh, I'm on my way to finishing the entire Fazbear Frights series uh, of audiobooks. Uh, Felix the Shark is coming out in April. Um, and then once you've done that, then that'll be all of the, the Fazbear Frights, hopefully. So I, I think all of the audiobooks should be out, uh, I guess by May. And then we can go to Tales from the Pizza Plex. Oh my God. Anyway. Yeah. Thank you so much for watching uh, or listening. And, uh, I will see you in the next audiobook. Goodbye.